Hello, all of y'all. Uh, my name is Neil, and I'm with me is Dan Axelrod, Daniel Axelrod. And we're here to talk about how data loves Fedora and what we do with it and the lessons that, um, you know, that Fedora can learn from us about contributing and how we've learned to contribute as well. Um, so to start with this, like, let's talk a little bit about who we are. Um, so my I consider myself a little bit of a professional technologist. I've been doing stuff with Linux for 15 years, give or take. Um, I'm a contributor and developer um, in Fedora, OpenSUSE, Magia, OpenMandriva. Got a little bit uh, uh, here and there with Debian and Ubuntu. Um, and you'll probably find me like listed somewhere, probably in a few Arch things or whatever. Like I, I've lost track at this point. Uh, and uh, I'm a member of Fesco as well as many Fedora SIGs and working groups. And that's really been enabled by, you know, Datto, who has employed me generously as a DevOps engineer, you know, for whatever that kind of means. But the most important part is um, what I do tends to help me relate within Fedora, and they let me, you know, spend my time helping with Fedora to help Datto. And so there you go. And uh, Dan, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Daniel Axelrod. The shortest way to sum up a lot of what I do is build platforms. Um, and I firmly believe that we get better technology by being empathetic towards people. Uh, I've been a Linux user for about 16 years. Um, I started on Slackware and quickly ran into expecting that Slackware 16 years ago would have a good package manager and didn't, um, which is how I eventually made my way to, uh, to other OSs. Uh, that ended up making me kind of a package management nerd. Um, and in fact, I once wrote a terrible yum clone. You will not hear anything about this terrible yum clone in this talk. Um, it, the details of it are best buried. <laughs> uh, I am also a senior uh, DevOps engineer at, uh, at Datto, and I'm on Nail's team. Well, we already got our first comment. He wants to know about your terrible yum clone. Maybe that'll be my flock talk. <laughs> All right. What was the so... yum clone called? It of course. Oh, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> so, um, just a little bit about Datto. Um, we were founded in 2007. We got around 23 offices around the world. You know, we we're 1,800 strong and growing. Um, we operate exclusively in what's known as the channel, which means that we operate um, in a market where we sell to businesses who sell to other businesses, and through that network of our customer management, whatever, we have 17,000 plus managed service provider partners that we work with to sell our products, to sell the, them to their customers. Um, and what we tend to offer is managed services for managed service provider oriented IT solutions so that they can help support companies that may not necessarily have the um, wherewithal to ha handle their own IT solutions. And so that that starts with the what we call unified continuity, which is our disaster recovery um, business continuity solutions that do backups and restores and stuff like that, as well as networking, the file sync and share stuff, and then as well as service automation and um, business management solutions and machine management, mass management platform solutions. Um, but you know that's not what we're here for. We're here for why Fedora. Um, so. You'll, you might be surprised, but the reason why Fedora really comes down to those four pillars that make up Fedora, the four Fs, freedoms, features, first, and friends. And we'll start with the first pillar. is like the closer to upstream but stable platform that Fedora is with the upstream first philosophy, it leads to a great dynamic between Fedorans and the projects they ship. But you're shipping the latest stuff that is tested and integrated well with things like Fedora CI and OpenQA and Bodhi and things like that. And it provides an excellent solid foundation to build upon. And it makes it so that it's a very trustable platform to build everything that we want to build and start from. And as we go through that and we start using those bits for ourselves, it's 
the tooling that is built in Fedora for supporting the distribution, supporting leveraging it for various components and things like that, or even like enabling contributions and stuff is fantastic. They have a nice separation of concerns across the different scopes. Um, it enables picking and integrating the bits that we've needed. It's a lot of it is super adaptable for purposes that probably weren't conceived before. Um, like internally, we don't use Koji. We use a system called OBS, Open Build Service, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and it's a nice echo of the Unix philosophy, I think, in the way that people really intended it to be, where you have tools that are fit for purpose that can be juggled around and adapted and integrated well for whatever purpose you feel like. And so this is really handy for us, and it makes it easy for us to uh, you know, use and remix the tooling for what our purposes. Um, and we contribute back as, as it makes sense and where things can be beneficial for Fedora as well. Um, and the bias towards action, this is actually one of the things that aligns really well for us in, uh, for, it's a data core value that we, we try to go forward and, and we can do stuff. And if it turns out to go bad, they can be fixed. So this aligns very well with the features pillar. And this is emphasized all over the place in all kinds of interesting ways, like the lazy consensus model for changes, like the way that someone can come up with a feature uh, or a change and propose it and the community debates it and then it goes up for Fesco. And then if there aren't strong objections to it, it goes out and it gets implemented. And this is how, you know, this lazy consensus model plus this continuous improvement through these changes um, allows Fedora to be successful at delivering a best in class platform. And for us, that's awesome because it means that you guys aren't afraid to make you know, a better thing and you're not afraid to make a splash for it and everyone benefits from it. It's not just about Fedora, it's, you know, it supports you know, distributions like OpenSUSE, um, Debian, Ubuntu, you know, Ev Arch, everyone. And that's fantastic and it helps us as well because some of the things we'd like to do, we look at it and we and we take it in even as we take it in or we even propose into. And that helps us and helps everyone. Um, but of course, the most important part is that the community is collaborative and very friendly. The genuine desire to help everyone with the, the interlocking bonds across the six, the teams, the working groups, whatever, and the default assumption of like, everyone is working to help each other. It's a positive intent. And this extends out to beyond Fedora, like as we as it goes to across other projects and things like that. This makes this makes it so much more fun and much easier for people to feel comfortable with bringing them their best self into into the community, into the project. And that has that is something that we really enjoy from the data side. Like it's super easy for people to come in, meet other folks, try to work together and get something done um, really well. And so that has been fantastic. Um, and to kind of jump past that, let's talk a little bit about like how Datto projects and products wind up using Fedora. So we use a wide range of technologies across the board. So I think the most obvious one is that we use Fedora Linux itself. We also use a lot of the packages and backport it for our own things. Um, we use KVM and Libvirt. We use OKD with Fedora Core OS. Um, for we obviously have with our, some usage of CentOS, and we're doing some work with CentOS Stream um, recently. Uh, and we're also using Fedora Apple on top of that because you know why why use why use it without Apple? That's crazy talk. And we contribute to all of these things where we can. We also use Spacewalk for uh, for our machine management, for workstation management, and Foreman for our server management, as well. As, so LIO is the, and we use LIO, which is the Linux IO target. I think Linux IO is what it's called. Um, it's basically the iSCSI tools that are used um, for managing uh, targets and initiators and all those sorts of things. And this is actually under the Fedora umbrella. And although it's not that well known, it is in fact part of it. Um, yep, that's right. Uh, Linux iSCSI target. Um, I don't know why it's called LIO. I think it means Linux IO, but it's it's still weird. Anyway, uh, point past that. 
Um, the starting point for this is like the Datto Linux agent. This involves the CentOS stream. So the Datto Linux backup agent is actually part of our business continuity disaster recovery solutions. Um, it enables seamless backups of Linux systems. Um, and it's it basically is built on, with two components in, my, uh, in place. The Datto BD, which is an open source kernel module, um, and Datto Linux agent daemon, which is a proprietary user space daemon for interfacing with our with our appliances. Um, and this solution was introduced in 2015 to add support for Linux systems. And with that, we have done over 300 releases since we since we started in five years ago and over 50 distribution releases across that time frame. Um, currently we support slightly under half with the latest Data Linux agent versions. Um, we actually do in fact support all the Fedora, uh, all the currently supported Fedora releases. We've actually supported Fedora since Fedora 20. Um, of course, we support Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, we've supported OpenSUSE and well, uh, even into the transition of OpenSUSE Leap, SUSE Linux Enterprise, and of course Debian and Ubuntu LTS. But like we, we actually do support Fedora for this for this product, and that has massively helped us. And furthering along those lines is that when CentOS Stream started, we we started integrating this into our process. And as I said, keeping up with the Joneses, it's enabled us to build and test the data Linux agent for the for RHEL and keep up with changes in the RHEL kernel. And as things kind of start coming up every once in a while, we have now the opportunity to contribute to fix problems we discover in RHEL as it progresses through CentOS Stream before it hits our customers. And this is a valuable thing for, for both us and I think also for, for CentOS and RHEL because it helps prevent issues down the line in upcoming RHEL releases. And in some cases, it makes it so that it enables other things that people I doubt thought were, were possible before. Um, like just straight up example off the top of my head. Uh, when, when CentOS Stream first came out and CentOS 8 was rolling out, I discovered fairly early on that there was a problem that made it so that I couldn't build images. I just went and fixed it. I sent a pull request. We got that integrated in. I filed a corresponding bug to say, hey, Red Hat, please pull this into RHEL. And they went and took care of it. And so that's all good. Uh, and leaning on past that, we obviously do quite a bit of backporting stuff um, because, of course, that's how it kind of has to work when we're, when we're rolling out stuff onto products. But we backport a lot of stuff from Fedora, but not necessarily to CentOS or whatever. We're actually backporting Fedora packages to our platform, which is currently Ubuntu-based. And Fedora packages are stable, recent, and tested, which is very, very useful for us because it lets us have a, a level of assurance about whether the software will actually work as we cherry pick it back into, into our platform. And so we use a tool called DebBuild uh, which lets us use RPM spec files uh, to take that as inputs to build Debian packages. We have actually, we often do for almost everything, I think now, we build for Fedora and Cent or CentOS and Ubuntu at the same time and verify that everything is still working, the behaviors are consistent. And we maintain and develop ports of Fedora macros for DebBuild to run so that we can do this sort of thing. And it has massively improved our ability to get things rolling faster and to get our feature enablement going um, in a much more coherent and cohesive way and on time. On time's, on time's important. Um, and rolling into that, like our package build stuff, we've started looking into building things, um, leveraging modules because the whole modularity stuff is super interesting. Um, but of course, we don't use Koji. We use the open build service, which is SUSE's version of Koji. Um, it's designed to support a wide variety of Linux platforms, such as Red Hat, Fedora, SUSE, Debian, Ubuntu. They offer a hosted version as the open SUSE build service, and that appliance image is freely available for you to set up on your own. And we have our own host. We actually self-host our OBS instance for our use. And why we use it is the source input flexibility the easy scaling of resources to just, we spit up workers and they work. But the biggest is that it automatically handles chain builds and deals with all the dependency issues to resolve and clean things up and get it so everything's linked correctly and works. Um, it was straightforward to deploy and it lets us build the packages with the spec file for both Debian and RPM distributions. And so we've we've gone down that road and used it. Of course, we did 
we did need to do work for modularity. And so we worked with the OBS team along with members of the DNF team and the Fedora modularity team to hash out a strategy to support modules in OBS. The upstream OBS project you know, did some work over the course of the last year, which led us to refocus on porting that to the stable OBS release. We, we added support for that, and that was pulled into OBS 2.10.1 with our assistance. And we started using that basically immediately to take advantage of modules at scale. And we're, we're actually really aggressively adopting modules to build out um, our solutions um, internally. And to kind of talk more about that, I'm going to hand this off to Dan to talk about our containerized web apps, which actually involves this whole scale of things that I was just talking about. I should admit. Um, so um, one of the things I've been working on recently is uh, some of our strategy around uh, containers going forwards. And um, one of the um, one of the one of the parts of Datto's software ecosystem that makes the most sense to containerize is uh, our web apps. We have a ton of different web apps. Some of them are, are front ends uh, that people are interacting with. Some of them are services. Um, and as they grow and gain and get more complex and have interdependencies, um, containers give us a lot of benefits for them. So uh, I'm going to be focusing uh, right now on specifically our, our PHP container stack. Um, Datto heavily uses PHP. So a lot of our web applications are um, PHP applications using the Symfony web framework. So modularity actually became an extremely useful feature when building out these containers. Uh, and the reason is really that everyone wants a different stable. Everyone wants stable, but everyone has a different idea of what stable should be. So on one hand, you have application engineers. They care about um, the language stack. Um, the, the PHP version um, ends up being somewhat tied to the, uh, the application framework version. So in order to use a newer version of Symfony, you, uh, you often need a newer version of PHP. Um, and PHP has, um, you know, with every new version, they, things get deprecated, eventually phased out, new features get added. So um, application engineers care about which PHP version they're using. Um, and because there are a lot of teams coordinating on these apps, there, there needs to be at least somewhat agreement on these are the following PHP versions we're going to support. And then when we need to move forward, everybody needs to go through a process of moving forward. OK, great. Everybody agrees. We want PHP uh, 7.4. Cool. Let's start working to, to go to 7.4. When I say everyone, though, that's the application engineers, because the infrastructure engineers care about OS versioning. And they have very different needs and different cadence. Um, their concerns about what OS to use and what to upgrade uh, come down more to um, uh, compatibility, compatibility with deployment tools, um, interdependencies between, um, between different servers, and also there are security concerns. For example, um, oh, for compliance reasons, uh, everything needs to move to, for example, this new crypto algorithm that's only supported in libraries that are in this version of the OS so we need to update um, now, but then we hold off for a while. Um, like I said, all of, everybody from both parties wants something stable. They ideally like distro maintained software, so that every time there's a um, every every time there's a, a security fix or a bug fix, uh, you don't need a team of people internally um, managing uh, exactly how that gets rolled out, what it breaks, uh, who gets it when. So what we've come down to for, for a container stack is uh, an LTS OS um, with newer PHP, and modules are the perfect way to implement that. So right now, we've picked uh, UBI 8 and CentOS 8 um, as the, uh, as the, um, as the OS base. And then um, people can pick the PHP version they want on top of that. So um, some of some of the containers enable uh, PHP this PHP 7.2 module. Some of them enable the PHP 7.3 module. 
Um, the 7.4 module will come out soon. Um, but this is, this is absolutely amazing for, uh, for letting teams work at the pace they want to work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you have dealt with PHP extensions before. Uh, PHP extensions are native code that are loaded, uh, that's loaded into the PHP runtime. You, you build an SO, um, it, it, uh, it gets loaded in. Um, PHP doesn't come with a lot of sophisticated uh, tooling to, um, uh, to kind of manage that. So you end up having to do things like deal with, um, deal with dependencies of this extension requires this extension. And you also end up caring about the load order of the SOs in runtime. That, that ends up going into a configuration file and you actually need to care about this library has symbols that this other library needs, so they need to be loaded in the following order. Um, so all of this really, really could use a package manager to, uh, to make it easier. Uh, I say this because our original strategy was, um, cool, let's use a similar strategy to, uh, to the community-maintained PHP containers on Docker Hub and have a source-built PHP with source-built extensions we ended up with the, all these hairy scripts around them until we realized DNF solves all of this. So now we just DNF install the PHP extensions we want. Uh, the, the package manager takes care of dependencies. The, um, uh, the packaging itself takes care of configuring things in a same load order and everything gets composed well together. Um, what's neat about that is we can also get uh, extensions from a bunch of different places. So uh, some of our extensions come from the, um, the, PHP, uh, the, the PHP module itself that's supplied by the OS. Uh, I actually didn't have a bullet point for this. Some of them come from uh, Apple. And for extensions that aren't in either, they're probably in Fedora because lots of great stuff is in Fedora. Um, so we do a backport from Fedora, and then we have a, an easily packaged extension. Um, what's really neat is that um, we have things to the point, Neil wrote up some scripts so that you run a script, and now we have a maintained backport uh, with the sources and spec from Fedora, but built for, uh, for all the different modules we're using. Next slide. Okay, so we have a bunch of applications. They're in a bunch of containers. Uh, it sure would be great to have some software to run all of these containers and, uh, and help you build them and help you manage them. So uh, this is where OKD and Fedora CoreOS come in. Um, so in production right now, we're using um, version three of the uh, OKD Kubernetes distribution. Um, we're mainly using it for uh, as a container registry and uh, to do our container builds. Uh, it it's, gives us a, a, a really smooth experience for having uh, fast reproducible builds of, of all our containers. Uh, we have been looking at OKD4, um, which uh, in case anybody here hasn't heard, um, OKD4 has gone out of beta after, uh, after an extensive beta period, and it's now GA. Go use it. It's awesome. Um, we, have a, we have a proof of concept where we're, um, we're testing that out and testing out workflows around it. Um, it gives a really great developer experience. Um, the, uh, the ODO tool uh, is a command line tool that, um, that works with OKD to um, make it easier to have uh, a really tight loop from when you edit code to when it's running in a container um, in ways that are not just, I'm interacting with Podman on my local machine, but stuff is different in the cluster. Um, and it's also got a really good admin console. It has, uh, I think, the best admin console of any Kubernetes distribution for developer workflows uh, that, that we were able to find. And underlying OKD is is Fedora CoreOS. Um, Fedora CoreOS is the perfect admin experience for a bunch of container hosts because you don't need a configuration management tool to manage it. 
Um, it's an image, and then it upgrades itself to a new image, and the cluster can manage it all, and it's not your problem. It's just all taken care of for you. Um, and you know that, that all of your nodes look exactly the same underneath because they should. Uh, so as, as part of this, uh, data employees are members of the OKD working group um, and um, uh, were, were involved in, in a lot of the conversations around uh, what it would take to get um, OKD4 to, uh, to GA. And uh, next slide, please. So um, this is where I take back over. Um, so, you know, you heard from Dan talking about all of this container stuff and, and workstation things, the, 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 sorry, all this container stuff and, and modularity and all that, all those good crunchy things for developers. Um, I tend to live a little bit lower in the stack. So let's talk about workstation systems management because that, that's a realm where I live in. Um, we actually use Spacewalk for wrangling our workstations, so to speak. So the reason we do this is because engineers can choose any distribution, uh, well, within reason. Like we support um, Fedora, we support CentOS, and we support OpenSUSE Leap, and we support um, Ubuntu LTS. Those are the options that, that they can choose from. Because, And we've done work within Spacewalk upstream to help support these platforms. Um, and, the, and our philosophy here is that our compliance is through auditing rather than control, because we generally trust our, our engineers to make smart decisions about what they need to do. And we also trust them that they're making changes to their systems to help support their needs to build our products and solutions and services. Uh, so from that perspective, Spacewalk works great for us. And, and that's primarily because it doesn't mandate that you have to have a control mechanism on the workstations for managing them and or for maintaining them even really. So that's why we've kind of gone down that road. Um, for our servers, we do it with Foreman and Foreman obviously enforces this mass management and control mechanism and we do it that way as well. Um, so like servers are tightly controlled. Uh, for virtualization restores, uh, I guess I'm gonna kind of hand this back off to Dan because he he's good at talking about this sort of thing. Sure. Um, so our, uh, our backup products uh, deal with VMs in a couple of interesting ways, and KVM and Libvirt are essential projects as, as part of that. So uh, one of the ways in which our products can take uh, backups of your machines, rather than having an agent running within the machine, we if your machine is a VM, uh, we can talk to the hypervisor and use hypervisor native features uh, to take backups. And so we use libvirt uh, as, as a really nice abstraction layer over uh, a bunch of different hypervisors so that we can support uh, KVM, Hyper-V, VMware, um, all, as, uh, all as backup targets. Um, the other really cool thing that we do is um, backups are no good unless you can restore them. That's, that's one of the rules of, of backups. A backup you can't restore is, uh, is not going to help you. And one of our options for restoring a backup is to restore it directly into a VM, either in your VM infrastructure um, or in our VM infrastructure uh, on, uh, on our metal. So we use KVM as the hypervisor for, uh, for running the, uh, the, these VMs. Um, in, in order to manage the complicated process of, here's a bunch of temporary VMs that we don't control the contents of because they're everything from people's workstations to servers, but we gotta run them all. And back to you, Neil. So, I mean, you've heard from where what we love about Fedora and what we're doing with and how we're trying to you know, be involved here to, and why we like being involved. Um, so I just want to, you know, touch on a little bit about how to make participation in Fedora even better than it already is, because it's already pretty great. There's definitely room for improvement. Um, it's easy to participate, but it could be way easier to figure out. Fedora has a well-defined contribution process model, and tools that support drive-by and sustained contributions are very, 
very much top tier. Um, a fan favorite internally is Packers remote pull requests. Uh, we we internally mirror Diskit into our system. And whenever we're making changes that we want to actually contribute back to Fedora, we set up a branch and we push it back out to a public mirror that we can then just go ahead and go into Packer and then just type in the URL in the branch and just submit it as a pull request. This has literally, we've literally gotten props. Like I've, I've literally received feedback from other people in the company saying like, this is fantastic. And, and I, and like, they don't know why other people don't have this. And it's just, it, it, it turned into a super big fan favorite. So like, that's awesome. Um, getting started, however, is super overwhelming for people. Um, the wiki pages that are linked to from the, what can I do for, for fedora.org website is awful. Um, we hack around this by mentoring, you know, other people within the company who are actually familiar with contributing to Fedora. Like, but this doesn't scale uh, very well. Um, one thing that could really, really help is taking a hard look at those pages and and breaking up that flow and that information into more bite-sized chunks to make it a lot less scary and to make easier to, to um, you know, kind of walk people through the process of, of doing your first your first package, sending in your first patch, you know, making your first edit or updating some docs. Like right now, like I look at the pages and at least one of them, I think I I did the print to PDF and it was like 15 pages. That's a lot of de dense information in one page. So that's something that would really help. And, you know, just some making it easier to discover some of these, you know, features that help support contributions more easily would also help as well. Like the, the, the remote pull request was a godsend and it's not exactly called out to anywhere, um, but it's a very awesome thing. So like, you know, you're doing great, just, just a little bit more to make it better. So and that's kind of it for our, I guess what we would call prepared remarks. Um, if you want to check out more about us, like we have our engineering blog at data.engineering. If you want to join us, maybe we're hiring data.com slash careers. And you can check out our public github.com and gitlab.com um, organizations and see what, what we've got there. We've got a fair few open source projects as well as some other things there. Um, you know, questions, comments, we're here to, to, to lay it out. with a comment everybody here give yourself a hug because the fedora community is fantastic to work with how how do People put them in the chat and then we answer them. I believe this is how this works. I mean, we're, uh, so we were muted, I think, just out of habit. We don't have to be muted. Oh, let's see. Ben Cotton just gave us a question. If you could change one thing in Fedora to make it work better for Dado, what would that be? Oh, boy. Ben, you don't ask the easy ones. <laughs> um, one thing. Okay. Uh, um uh, let's see if i could change one thing just only one you know what i'm going to i'm going to punt this i'm going to ask dan to to, to do this okay. um for me for me it was really the getting started problem of um i want to contribute a, a patch to a spec file um wait i can't just like have have Pagger trust my keys and and push to a Git remote. There's this whole like auth process that opens up a web browser, but I'm on a headless machine, and so I I know work has been done since then. This is this experience was also uh, probably about a year ago, but it was it was uh, it was kind of frustrating to be already with a patch and then have that last little bit of how do I get the patch to where somebody can see it require way more steps than, um, than I'm used to. That said, um, 
in IRC, people were super helpful at getting me through them. Uh, and that goes back to some of that mentoring. But um, the, I believe also the docs have been improved since then. Just so what Dan just said reminded me of my one thing I could, I want to change about Fedora that could make it better. Oh my goodness. We got to stop making people have to do all of the rebuild work by hand for themselves. My goodness. Like if I, if somebody updates a library, they shouldn't have to search for all of it themselves, figure out whether they can do this, push it forward. Oh, and make sure they have permissions to update everything. Like that is the worst thing that I have ever experienced. And that is the one thing that if I could wave a magic wand, that is what I would fix. Like I would make that entire problem just go away because that is how much I don't like that. Um, and Josh Boyer asked like, what are my, our biggest pain points? That's one of them. Um, I think the other pain point that I, one of the other pain points I would say is there is a lot of stuff that is in a half finished state that there is no, there's no clear way for people to kind of get involved to, to help push things over the finish line. Like there's a lot of little initiatives here and there, but they're all kind of closed off and it makes it difficult for, for, for someone like me to jump in and say, let's, let's push this over the finish line. Let's fix this. Let's contribute. Let's make this like this better. There's a lot of little things like that. Um, the dynamics among uh, the the other the other pain point I would say is that some of the the dynamics with um, where am I going with this uh, with how we do the builds to test to release while it's all happening it's not very observable and that makes things a little bit difficult for me to feel like I have the, the I have actionable feedback to be able to work from. Um, like I recently just got bitten by something like this, just not even a week ago. And that's sort of a thing that's, that I really wish was less of a problem. Like we do a lot of fantastic testing and things across the, the project, but, but it's not observable. Like how would you find out that, oh, when you kick, when a Kochi build completes, it runs through a bunch of tests and those are, those are stored somewhere. You don't. You especially don't find out until it, until you submit an update in Bodhi, and at which point it's too late for you to act on that feedback because it's already permanent and stuck. Things like that. Um, those are pain points to me because it makes it difficult for me to feel like I can iterate quickly and I can do things effectively. Um, so that that like from the pure like I am mechanically working through stuff point of view, those are my pain points. Um, uh, Dan, do you do you have any others in particular? Like, I know you you tend to focus a little bit more on like the communications and interplay kind of things. So, maybe you have some oh. feedback here. I I actually can't think of anything else off the top of my head. No. So then, uh, I guess that part's fine. Um, that are going on right now in terms of like the um, RPM auto spec stuff where it's doing the release and change log stuff automatically is good. I mean, the Koshe stuff is really cool, um, but I really wish Koshe pushed to production immediately, automatically. But I think the RPM auto spec plus Koshe might actually help this. Um, I really do like some of the concepts of MBS. I don't understand why it's a separate system. I really don't get that. Like, it some of the functionality in there is useful for even non-modular builds. It should actually be part of it should actually be part of Koji. Um, there's things like that which makes me a little bit like somebody it needs to like holistically think about the experience. I think that's that's what this comes down to. Like all of this comes down to like, while there's a lot of great things here. Nobody has like thought about the holistic contributor experience in such a way that makes it much more streamlined and much more um, effective at helping people get work done. Um, yeah, uh, Koshe does not make PRs, gens. It actually just, it'll rebuild off of already pushed commits. Um, yeah, so 
Uh, is there any other questions in here? Um, so is there any other questions? Because at the moment, I just see people talking to each other in the chat. Which is, which is great. It's good, dis it's good yeah. discussion. Yeah, it's good stuff. Some of the six. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's some mitigating things that help set this, up, set this up. Like you have SIGs that have ownership and you have proven packagers and stuff like that. But I'd like to move towards a world where proven packagers don't need to exercise their abilities as much to do the things that need to be done anyway by even normal people. Like it, it's a barrier to entry. And if somebody says, hey, I want to update this library to this new version that, yes, it bumps the so name, but it brings like XYZ awesome new features and it'd be super useful for everyone else to be able to start from. It's so hard. Um, what's, oh, Ben's got a good one. What's the CentOS stream experience been like for you so far? What could make it better? Um, CentOS stream is weird. So I'm going, I give it a lot of passes because it's so new and it's, and, and like the CentOS project is not, a, has historically not been a real community in the sense that there is not people being actively participating in, what it does. This is a relatively new thing for them. Um, that being said, there are two things that really grind my gears about CentOS Stream. The first is that pull requests are pointless. They are absolutely, completely, 100% useless. Um, if you make them, they don't go anywhere. They just kind of sit there. And eventually, they go to a bugzilla, which you need to independently track. And then they might get merged, but you don't know until some nebulous push at some point happens. Um, I understand why that's happening. Again, this is all new. It's very hard to set all this stuff up from zero. Um, it is an unpleasant experience if you don't have any background. Um, what could definitely make it better is do more like what Fedora does. Make it so that you, know, you have the same contribution model. You make it easier for the drive-by changes and people react and give feedback quickly. Like if I make a pull request to a package on Fedora, uh, about six times out of 10, I'm going to get a response in the form of a comment or it going to be merged within three days. Um, I don't think that's ever been anywhere close to the case for the few pull requests I've done for CentOS stream. Um, and I don't like that. And I, and like, I want to be able to do the same workflow I do for Fedora for CentOS. I want to be able to do remote pull requests that because of packages that I've mirrored and done all the stuff. Uh, I want to be able to send those. I want those patches to get feedback response for the people maintaining those things. I want to be able to react and respond to them um, relatively quickly so that I still have the context in my head. All of those things, um, I think, would make it better. Um, so if I want to say, what's the one thing that can make CentOS stream better? Do like Fedora does that, like that, that's Fedora has a fantastic wellspring of historical expertise and knowledge and infrastructure and tooling. Reuse that. It's very useful stuff. It's why we like Fedora. And I want to also like CentOS Stream in the same way. CentOS Stream is valuable. I love using it. And I and we do take advantage of it. But this is where it could be better. And I'll, um, I'll make this point. If, if you're a corporate software engineer with, um, with internal deadlines, having, having, the, having the like feedback uh, on your on your contributions within a few days is a great way to convince your management that you should be doing work in the open and in the upstream. Uh, the longer it takes for you to get feedback, get collaboration, the easier it is going to be for everyone to say, well, why don't you just give up on them, make your own internal fork and then upstream it later. And then it's harder and harder to upstream it later. So the um, the, the more collaboration you get, especially from corporations, comes from the being able to iterate fast. Uh, so another good 
Adams. Ribeiro, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. I'm not great with these things. Uh, if you, you asked if you, we introduced modularity to OBS, are you the only users or of the feature out there? How many people on your side were involved in maintaining that instance and pushing things upstream? Okay, so um, I maybe I misphrased this, but like the initial code development for the feature in the open build service was actually done by the OBS team after getting feedback from us and the DNF team and the Fedora modularity teams, where we basically figured out a plan of how it was gonna get done. Once it was actually, like once the initial code had been written, um, uh, myself and Dan worked on figuring out the, pulling that code, testing it and validating it internally for OBS 2.10. And we backported that and that got merged and released. And then we started using it then. Um, as far as the only ones uh, who is using it, um, I think we're the only ones I know of. I mostly because I don't think the feature has been talked about too much. Um, it, it, it's a very valuable. It's a new feature, but it's also listed technically as experimental by the OBS team for a couple of reasons. One, the format for module MDs and repos is unstable. We do not have a final definition of all the behaviors that is supposed to exist. And two, um, the module support in OBS is very weak. It is at this point only capable of consuming modules. It cannot produce them. This is something that's a follow-up effort that um, that we that my team is probably going to start looking into as we start revving up more usage of modularity. Um, it's certainly something that we have been discussing off and on for uh, I mean at least a couple of months now. Um, um, how many people are maintaining that OBS instance? It's mostly, it, it's my team maintains it. It's a team of five people. Um, I am the primary maintainer of it with Dan as my secondary. Um, but there are a couple of others, like um, another one who's on my team, who's actually also participating in Fedora a little bit. Um, Dalton Miner uh, is also a thing. Uh, also, sorry, not also a thing. It's also participating and maintain in maintaining the system and helping us support these workflows. Uh, so like it, we do have a, a number of people working on this. Um, producing modules is not our top priority right now because we're right now focused on the container stuff and we can we can skip a whole bunch of things when with the way that we're doing the container stuff. But it is something that we are looking into because as we start expanding our usage of the modularity technology more, this will become more important for us to solve. Um, and at some point it may be it, it may be vital for our partners right. um, to to have agents that um, to have agents that are that are part of streams, depending on how their their dependency trees work out. Right. Like right now, we've been very lucky. We've managed to to avoid having a dependency on a on a stream at runtime, or at least a non default stream at runtime. Once that changes, we really have to deal with that. And and hopefully that isn't going to be for a while, but that's certainly, it, it, it's at the back of our mind and it's certainly something we're thinking about for doing this. Um, Jacob Kradischik, uh sorry if I screwed up your name, uh, mentioned that uh, there's some single purpose tools that they're working on for Copper to support building modules and it might be useful for OBS. Yeah, uh, actually, funnily enough, I think Daniel Mock mentioned it to me this morning. Uh, and I was like, yeah, this is definitely going into my bookmarks to look into. Um, and I think Dan and I will definitely take a look at it and seeing about this. Um, there are some definitely some ideas in there that I think we could reuse and we'll most likely wind up having an OBS to module uh, um, tool to, to handle mapping an OBS project to an, uh, a YUM repository with the, with modularity data. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, also, thank you for coming, Josh. Uh, I, I, I didn't expect that. Um, and, and thanks for all the great questions so far. Um, I, I, I won't de-anonymize them here, but I saw at least one alum from our team in the audience, and it's it's awesome to see you. Yeah, no, it was great. I, I'm I'm glad to see like one of our one of our form our alums actually kind of showed up for our talk. It's great. 
Um, As so our, you know, slot was, our slot was until uh, 50 after, right? Yes, technically, yes. Although I think almost everyone's been running over slightly, but we don't have to run over. I, I think if everyone's if everyone's all said and done, then I guess we can we can kind of end it here. Um, if anyone, if no one's got anything else, I mean, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank, you so thank you to listen for listening to us. You know, talk about our love for Fedora. <laughs> um, Y'all are great. Keep up the great work. And it was our pleasure for sponsoring Nest. <laughs>